behind there and follow along with the message today as we uh, look at the word together. And while you're doing that, I just want to share and extend our church's sympathy to the following. Uh, Stephanie Shepard's mother um, passed away this past week and uh, Dale Heiss's sister and, of course, uh, Lynn Hicks, who attended here uh, as well, and then Steve Bragg's niece, um, and then Herbert Proctor, who's Lola Proctor's brother-in-law, and then recently Carla Wilson's uh, mother. And so our, our church uh, extends our sympathy to them, and if there's any that we missed that we're not aware of, please let us know. We didn't intend to, to leave anyone out, but we just want the church family to be aware of those families so they can provide uh, comfort um, as well. Many point to the Sermon on the Mount as the greatest sermon ever preached. And it's in this message that Jesus gets right to the heart of what the Christian life should look like and what it's all about. Uh, it was Augustine that described it as, as the perfect standard of the Christian life. Oswald Chambers once said, he said, The Sermon on the Mount is a statement of the life that we live when the Holy Spirit, that was just sung about here, is getting his way with us. That's what our life should look like. Even non-Christians like Mohandas Gandhi have, have commented about the truth and the power of Jesus' teachings and how it had an effect on his view of the world. You know, the original sermon that Jesus preached on the mountainside that day was, was probably quite lengthy, several hours long, a lot of scholars think. So you all are getting by with a 30-minute deal today. So you're... You're, pre you're pretty lucky. But what we have recorded for us in Matthew's gospel is probably just a summary, the Cliff Notes version, if you will, of the main points that Jesus preached on that day on that mountaintop. And I believe that if we truly meditate upon and apply the principles uh, uh, of what Jesus taught in this message, I believe it can do something to us spiritually. I believe that it can stir a lukewarm heart. And relight a fire that maybe has started to, to fade. So in, in upcoming sermons, we're, we'll take a look at a main point each week. And, and take an in-depth look at, at each point that Jesus made. And we'll try to meditate upon it and apply it to our lives. So that we can get to the heart of what this life is all about. If you have your Bible with you today, I encourage you to turn with me uh, to today's main text. Which is Matthew chapter 5. And we'll just be looking at the first three verses there and I want to credit author uh, Kent Hughes with uh, kind of the outline of what I want to share with you today. I've been studying a, a, a book that he has written on the Sermon on the Mount and uh, so I always want to credit uh, someone when I'm using uh, a lot of their thoughts and ideas. And so uh, the background of this text when we pick up in Matthew chapter 5 it's not long after Jesus' baptism uh, not long after he has been out into the desert and been tempted. And then he started his preaching out in Galilee. It's kind of where he started teaching in the synagogues. And already crowds of people were following him. They were hungry for this type of message and what he had to say. They had even followed him out into the wilderness areas beyond the Jordan River. And it's in that context that we pick up here. It says, seeing the crowds... He went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, probably it would help to, to think about what does this word blessed really mean. The first part of the Sermon on the Mount is known as the Beatitudes. And each of the, the eight Beatitudes begins with the word blessed or blessed, if that helps some of you from your King James background, all right? But it's so important that we understand exactly what Jesus is talking about when he uses this word blessed. Now, a lot of people would say, well, that means happy. Happy and cheerful is the person who realizes they are poor in spirit. But contrary to popular opinion, blessed does not necessarily mean happy even though some bible translations will even render it that way to mean happy but happiness is a subjective state it's a feeling you can be happy and sad and mad and all these things all in the course of a day it can can change but jesus isn't merely talking about our feelings here i don't, I, I really don't think rather jesus is making an objective statement about what God thinks 
of the person who is poor in spirit. They're blessed. Blessed means that your life finds the approval of God. Now, if you're like me and God's blessing, his approval of your life means everything more to you than anything else. Then if God what if what God thinks of you is more important than what your friends think of you. If what God thinks of you is more important to you than even what your family thinks of you. If it's more important than what society or our culture thinks of you or your colleagues that you work with think of you. If it's really more important then these beatitudes are going to impact you because Jesus is saying this is what makes the Father smile upon you. This is what really makes him happy. Max Lucado would call it the applause of heaven when he talks about God's approval. So this is so important, I think. I would like to just start with a word of prayer. And let's ask God to teach us over the next few weeks what makes God smile upon our life. What, what does God really want out of our lives? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, more than anything else, we want your approval upon our life. God, open, open our eyes. Give us understanding through your Holy Spirit. Teach us, God. Help us to understand spirit to spirit what you want for our lives. Give us a mindset that's in harmony with your will. God, sink our heart with your heart. Give us a passion for the things that you're passionate about. Prioritize our life in a way that, that, that harmonizes with your priorities. Give us a zeal for the things that, that stir you, Lord. Sink our heart to yours. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, what does it mean to be poor in spirit? Poverty in spirit. Let me tell you first what it's not. Being poor in spirit is not a lack of self-worth. It's not this, I'm just nobody. I don't really matter in the world. That's not what we're talking about here today. It, it, that attitude is not scriptural. The Bible tells us that all human life is valuable because you were made in the image of God. And beyond that, it also says in Psalm 139, he says, I praise you, the psalmist does, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. Listen, you are made in the image of God by our creator, and he doesn't make junk. You have value, so don't hear in this message today, oh, you've got to make yourself like this. You don't matter. That's not what I'm preaching today. Secondly, the poor, being poor in spirit doesn't mean that you have to be shy or timid. That's not what we're talking about. In fact, the Apostle Paul even gave this advice to, to a Timothy, who Scripture would seem to suggest or indicate Timothy kind of was a shy, timid person by nature. And Paul has to give him these pep talks and say, Look, you have got the gospel of salvation. Do you understand what power is in you? Don't be shy. You be bold in proclaiming this message. There's no room for shyness. And so he says in 2 Timothy 1, For God gave us a spirit. Spirit, not of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. So when we talk about being poor in spirit, we don't mean timid or shy today either. So what are we talking about? Being poor in spirit. Well, a good place to go is to go back and study the Word because the Bible is amazing in that it uses one of the most precise languages ever. The New Testament was recorded in Greek. And if you go back to the Greek word, the, the choice of word that they use there is patahos, which provides some insight into what Jesus probably meant. The root for this word means like a beggar, like a beggar. I love that phrase and that idea, and we're going to talk about that today. I believe it's an awareness that you are completely dependent upon outside help, and we should never get far from that understanding. So if we are poor in spirit, that would imply that we realize that we are so spiritually poor apart from Christ that we need outside help. A modern rendering of this verse might read something like this, blessed are those who realize that they have nothing within themselves to commend them to God. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Once you realize that you can't be religious enough, once you realize that you can't do enough good stuff to gain the approval of man and the approval of God and earn your ticket to heaven, Jesus said that's a good start. When you become a beggar in your heart. Now this flies in the face of the world's concept of what it means to be blessed 
of what it means to have really made it. The world values and promotes self-sufficiency. I got this. Independence. I don't need anybody. I'll do this myself. We hear things in our culture today like, I don't need anyone to tell me what's right or wrong. I'll decide that for myself. Don't you impose your values on me. Don't you be telling me, who are you to tell me that I'm wrong? Or I don't need to be a part of a church to live a Christian life. I've got my own walk with Jesus, and that's all I need. Who are you to say I need anyone else? You know, the world values strength and power. And it says things like Christianity, ah, that's just a crutch for the weak. That's just for weak people that need something to believe in and, and something uh, to, to, to put their hope in. But listen, poverty of the spirit, don't miss this, is important for salvation. You've got to have poverty of spirit to come to salvation. Psalm 149 verse 4 says, For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. Watch this. He adorns the humble, the humble with salvation. I share often from, from this stage that I fear there are a great number of people in our world today, in our culture, who have a false security or a false sense of security about what it means to be saved. It's not that they don't believe in God. It's not that they don't believe that there's a heaven or a hell even. But they don't have a concern for spiritual matters. They don't have a concern for the will of God because they believe they're already okay for eternity. They're already okay with Jesus. That there's something in them that's just all right. And as long as I don't mess that up, I'm good. I don't know what you all are so concerned about. People say things like, I'm going to heaven when I die because I'm basically, you all finish this for me. I'm a good person. I haven't done anything that bad. When I go to heaven, I'm fine. You go talk to the other people. Don't worry about me. But you know what? That sounds good. And I know a lot of good people that I consider friends. But they've never become poor in spirit. They've never reached a point where they say, you know what? I can't get there. I'm not a good person. The... the we need to understand this message. No one comes to Christ without a poverty of spirit. An essential part of responding to the gospel is to realize and admit, I am not a good person. I am not worthy of heaven. There's nothing within me that deserves heaven. You don't start out with heaven as your default destination, and then as long as you don't mess it up, you get in. That's not how it works. We start out as a sinner. We start out, the first time you sin, you are no longer holy, and you now are a sin-contaminated person not fit for heaven. And if you don't do something about that state, then hell is your eternal destination, not heaven. And that doesn't get preached a lot today. We're not basically okay. We are sinful. And the reality is that once you sin one time, you got a problem. And here's what Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned. And fall short of the glory of God. Including the man holding this mic and everybody in this room. That's us. And our eternal destination, if we had done or have we have not done anything about that, is hell. And not heaven. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin, even one, is death. So being poor in spirit means that you realize, listen, that you are spiritually bankrupt. You have nothing to bring to this deal. You are, you are broke and without hope unless someone helps you. But before you can be saved, you've got to understand and have a poverty of spirit that says, I am lost. And I think sometimes when we try to share the gospel with somebody, we leave this step out. Before you can lead somebody to get saved, you've got to lead them to understand they're lost. That's one of the hardest people to lead to Christ is somebody that doesn't think they need him. That doesn't understand what's at stake. We are beggars completely dependent upon outside help. And I want to tell you that, that. That there's only one person that can do anything about it. Amen? The only name by which we can be saved is Jesus Christ. He's the only one that can do something about our spiritual bankruptcy. Ephesians chapter 2 says this. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. There's nothing that you mustered up or you accomplished. This is the gift of God, 
not a result of work so that no one may boast. That sounds a lot like spiritual poverty to me. Realizing I am bankrupt and I need somebody to save me. As we attempt to share the gospel with others, make sure that we take them to a place of poverty in spirit. That we realize we are hopeless without Christ. And only when we acknowledge that spiritual poverty are we ready to receive true riches. Second of all, poverty of spirit is the key for spiritual growth. We never outgrow this first beatitude. Even if you've walked with Christ for 50, 60 years, you never need to get too far away from this basic understanding that we are poor in spirit. After we come to Christ, listen, it is so easy to just kick it into neutral and kind of become complacent. Can we all be real this morning? How many of us have reached a time in life where if we're honest, we say, I was just kind of going through the motions right there. You ever do that? And I'm not really growing spiritually. I don't really feel that fire inside that I used to. I used to be on fire. I was telling everybody about Christ. I was trying to live with such a passion and a, and a boldness. But here lately, just kind of been mailing it in. Just kind of going through the motions. When we hear the word of God preached, we, we think of all the people we hope are listening. But it's not about us, right? You ever do that? Oh, that's a message today. I hope so-and-so's here. They hear. I hope they hear that. Listen, God is speaking to each one of us, including the guy holding the microphone up here, because he beats me up all week over it. And he's taken me this week, as I've studied this, to a place of just spiritual poverty, saying, Greg, understand, first of all, you're, you're nothing. You're nothing. Okay? And he said it in a loving way because we're getting to the rest of this message here in a minute. Okay, But we need to not get very far from this message. It's so easy to get lulled to sleep spiritually by just going through the motions. You could have perfect church attendance and be just about spiritually dead. You can come in this place, stand when everybody's standing. You can sing along and, and just kind of go through the most. You can, can take the bread and the cup when they're passed. You can put a little something in the offering plate. And, and you can sit there through the sermon and make out your grocery list instead of filling in your bulletin. I know some of y'all do that. You can do all that stuff and keep looking at your watch. And say, Phew, it's finally over. Leave this place. Nothing has changed. And you are still just about this far from being spiritually dead. Going through the motions. Listen, that's not God's will. That's kind of what happened to the church at Laodicea that we read about in the book of Revelation. Here are the words that, that the Lord spoke to them. He said in Revelation 3, For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. It's as if he's saying, you think you've arrived, you've got it all together, and this gospel that's being preached is for everybody else. He says, look, you're still poor in spirit. You still need a daily filling from me to be able to do anything and keep moving forward. The person who's poor in spirit realizes that on a continuing basis, they are still dependent upon God for everything. In fact, the more that we grow in our faith, the more we should realize just how great our poverty is. The more I dig in that book, guys, the more I realize I don't know things. I haven't yet accomplished things. There's still a lot of construction that needs to go on in this old heart. I didn't know how spiritually bankrupt I was until I started studying the Bible. And I, and I become keenly aware that, you know what, I, I can't be the person that I need to be to represent Christ. I can't do that in my own strength. I can't be the husband that I need and that my wife deserves in my own strength. I get it wrong so often. I, I, I can, it's hard when you're a preacher because you stand up here and you tell everybody the way they're supposed to live and everybody says, you ain't doing that, Greg, right? It's hard. We fall short sometimes. I can't be the father that I need to be in my own strength. I need some outside help. I can't lead this church effectively in my own strength or my own wisdom. I wouldn't want to try it. I need some outside help. But the good news is that we have some outside help. Amen? God says when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, He places His Spirit in us. That Holy Spirit that was sung about today, He's so often neglected, so often forgotten. But He is our greatest asset and resource today. 
He wants to talk to you every day and, and guide you and help you make decisions and fill you with the strength and a boldness. Guys, the scriptures say, I can't do it. I have a spiritual poverty, but if I will tune in and listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit every day, Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. If God calls you to something, he will equip you to do it. The person who's poor in spirit is always striving to take the next step that God wants them to take. They're grateful that they aren't who they used to be, but they're not content with who they are. We're content in life with our lot in life, but we're not content spiritually. We want more of God. We want God to have more of us. And we're, it's the remedy, guys, for spiritual apathy. Thirdly, poverty of spirit is a key attribute of those who have been used by God. Sometimes before God uses someone for his glory, he takes them through a, a wilderness experience to humble them. And I think to take them to this first understanding of spiritual poverty. If you're a proud person, God's got to humble you a little bit before he can use you. Moses lived in exile in the wilderness. He'd been puffed up being raised in Pharaoh's court and taught that he was somebody. But he got a good dose of humility in the wilderness before he was ready to listen to a burning bush. The Apostle Paul was puffed up. He was somebody in Jewish society. But he was blinded by a great light on the road to Damascus. And later after that, even after he received his sight back, he was still left with a thorn in the flesh. He asked God to take it away. And God said, nope, that one's there for my purposes and reasons. As a little reminder of your poverty in spirit. Your dependence upon me. And I know that in my own life, there are some times that I look back and the times that I grew the most were not on some mountaintop or spiritual high. That, that's not in success. That's really not where I grew the most. I grew the most when I was going through a valley. When everything seemed like it was coming apart and I was not in control. Situations out of my control. Stress fears and failures when God was letting me go through a wilderness experience that drove me to my knees with a sense of inadequacy and I realized I'm not in control here. You ever been there? Let me tell you, when the problems of this world drive you to your knees and you think God has forsaken me, mm -mm, sometimes that's the very best place to be is on your knees. You know why? Should have been there to start with. Should have been there to start with. I, I'm striving to get to the point where I could stand on a mountain and I'm smart enough to still get on my knees and realize that I am a spiritual beggar. And whether I'm in a valley or on a mountain, I still need him day by day. I can't do anything without the Holy Spirit's power, without the truth of God in my life. You know, David became the greatest king of Israel, and the key to his rise to greatness was his poverty of spirit. Listen to his words at the beginning of, of his rise in 1 Samuel chapter 18. And David said to Saul, Who am I? And who are my relatives, my father's clan in Israel, that I should be son-in-law to the king? That sounds like humility, doesn't it? Later in life, David seems to acknowledge that it was God who was still bringing him up from his humble beginnings. Listen in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me? You have brought me thus far. Now, you go on in David's story. And all that success, he gets a little off track, doesn't he? And he seems to forget that he's poor in spirit. And he seems to get a little caught up in the flesh. And he has a little fall. But I'm thankful that he comes back and repents of that. But that's a lesson in itself. Now Gideon is a man that we read about in the Bible who was used by God to win a huge battle with just 300 men. That would be easy to get puffed up. But listen. Gideon displayed a humility and poverty of spirit when God called him to lead the army of Israel. In Judges 6, Gideon says, But Lord... How can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh. And I am the least in my entire family. God, I'm a nobody. God says, it's just the somebody I'm looking for. Because when I use people like that, I get all the glory. So you're just the one I've chosen. The Son of God was born to a young girl who voiced a poverty of spirit when she had been told that she was going to carry the Messiah 
into this world. Luke chapter 1, it says, And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Watch this. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. Mary says, I'm, I'm nobody. Why is this gift being given to me? Each of these people are examples of how God looks for those who are poor in spirit because that's the starting point for when he does something amazing in our lives. God looks for humble hearts. Those that know anything good I have, it's a gift from God. And it needs to be used for God. He takes our lowly status and he fills us with his power for his glory. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This is just the way God does it. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that it is written, let the one who boasts Boast in the Lord. The proud person is convinced of their own greatness and fails to see the power of God at work in their life. And they say things like, look what I did. Look what I accomplished. Guys, sometimes we celebrate around here what God is doing, but let, let there be no misunderstanding. Anything that we celebrate, we're saying, look what God has done in this place. Look what God is building in this place. The moment... That we say, look what we have done. It'll be gone in a moment. Don't you know that? Don't you know that? Everything that we have is through God's enablement and through his provision. But the humble person is poor in spirit and knows where the power comes from. And as always, you can, you can praise a, a person and they will, a humble person will say, it's him. It's not me. It's him. You may recognize the name Samuel Morse as the inventor of the telegraph. Despite his fame and the many honors that came his way, it said that he wasn't proud or boastful. And this, this excerpt from a letter that he wrote to his wife kind of gives some insight into that. It says, he says, The more I contemplate this great undertaking, the more I feel my own littleness, and the more I perceive the hand of God in it, and how he has assigned to various persons their duties, he being the great controller, all others his honored instruments. Hence, our dependence, first of all, on God, and then on each other. A very successful man who says, I got every bit of it from God. The more I learn, the more I realize he's God and I'm not. The more we empty ourselves of our pride, the greater the potential for God to work and move and operate in our lives. Sometimes your pride can be the thing that's getting in the way of God working in your life. 2 Corinthians says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Paul finally figured it out. I, I was blinded. I was humbled. And I was then given a thorn in the flesh. And every day that thorn reminds me I need God today. And I'm going to need him tomorrow. And I'm going to need him after that. But with him I can do all things. You know, I wrap up with this. The last part of that verse says, For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The reward of, of our heavenly kingdom, understand this, it has a dual nature. The kingdom of heaven is now and it's in the future. It's present because all who have accepted Christ are in the kingdom now. We are children of God now. We are overcomers in his power now. We don't have to wait for it. Now we have the Holy Spirit, the power and the working of God in our lives now. As spirit-filled believers, we are filled with the purpose for living now. Not just one day when I get up to heaven, but God has a purpose and a plan for your life now. We're called to exercise authority and be men and women and children of prayer and to pray and to move things in the spiritual realm that we see the effects of here on this earth exercising authority now but the reward of the poor in spirit is also in the future poverty of spirit is really what we're talking about it's true 
humility. It's not saying I don't matter in this world. It's saying on my own I'm nothing. But with Jesus Christ and his purpose and his spirit in me, I have everything. I have everything. One of the many awesome things about heaven, hear me. One of the things that I long to see is when the status system of this world, what's going to happen when we get to heaven? You know what the scriptures say, right? The first shall be last, and the last shall be first in heaven, right? We don't treat each other that way all the time here, do we? We got some people that we open all the doors and we give all the honor to them and they can make phone calls and make things happen and there's people we don't have any connections. There's people that don't know where they're going to sleep tonight or where their next meal is going to come from. They don't have a lot of status here on this earth. But I thank God that if we have this poverty of spirit that I'm talking about today and we admit I, I need Jesus Christ in my life and we can become a child of God that when we get to heaven, all this status stuff, you know what he's going to do? He's going to go, well, that looks right. He's going to turn it on its head, and he's going to say the least of these down here that had a poverty of spirit and realized that it's all about God and his glory, I'm going to give you what you deserve. You're going to be celebrated in heaven. All of you who were proud and arrogant and thought you were too intellectual, you were too smart, you were too blessed, you had it all together on your own, and you don't need a Savior. You're going to see what you really have in the end. Now, that doesn't give me joy to tell you that part. But I will tell you this. For all those in this life that feel like they're on the outside looking in, left out that everybody else is living this blessed life and has everything going for them, and it seems like you're barely getting by, I can't wait till you, see, till you see your true worth. I can't wait till you feel the love of the Father that already is available for you now. But you're going to see him face to face, and he's going to say, I love you this much. Come and enter in and feel how much I love you, and you've always meant to me. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Those who have served selflessly and given generously and nobody noticed, nobody stood and applauded and celebrated you or gave you a plaque. But in heaven, Jesus will say, I wrote it all down. It's all right here. Let's celebrate what you've done and we welcome you. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God and at the proper time, he will exalt you. Let's pray. God, I thank you. I thank you that your kingdom doesn't work exactly like this kingdom here. Lord, this kingdom often gets messed up. We value the wrong things. We celebrate the wrong things. And we neglect the good things many times. We neglect good people. God, I thank you that you're going to make everything right. I thank you, Lord, that your system is just and fair. And God, help us in this life. Despite what our culture tells us, to elbow our way to the front, to take it all for ourselves. Help us to be poor in spirit. To realize that we're nothing without you. But God, we celebrate and acknowledge today there is a Savior who is everything and wants to give us everything. We believe that what Jesus did on the cross, the blood that he shed there is the full payment for our sins. So we come as spiritual beggars just asking for a drop of that blood knowing that that blood can make us a child of God. Lord, if there's anyone here today that has never received Jesus, maybe they thought, I'm basically a good person. I, I don't need anything. I haven't done anything that bad. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us is a beggar in need of a Savior. Father, I pray that today will be a day of salvation for someone. That someone will say, I need the Savior, and his name is Jesus, and I put my faith in him. I repent of my sins. I want to strive to obey him with all my heart, knowing that his grace is there to catch me. What would prevent me from being baptized, washing my sins away, and being born again into a new life filled with your spirit? And we'll do the rest of this life together, God. In Jesus' name we pray these. Amen. If you're here today and that's a choice you need to make, what would prevent you from coming? Even if it's your first Sunday here,